let's move next to our um, pre-test questions for our next presentation. All right, so which of the following is a characteristic of a class three antiarrhythmics? Do they slow impulse conduction velocity and exhibit reverse use dependent effect? Do they prolong refractoriness and exhibit use dependent effect? Do they slow impulse conduction velocity and exhibit use dependent effect? Or do they prolong refractoriness and exhibit reverse use dependent effect? So this really gets into your understanding of antiarrhythmic medications. And, and Dr. Noseworthy, in addition to speaking about these physiological principles, is going to talk about the clinical applicability of um, understanding these principles. All right, let's see how people did here. All right. Peter, it looks like you're going to have some teaching to do. Let's go to the next question. What is the most appropriate? Whoops, can we uh, reset the polling there? There we go. All right. What is the most appropriate anti um, antiarrhythmic drug for a 57-year-old female with cirrhosis and paroxysm a paroxysmal AFib but no structural heart disease and normal renal function? Can There we go. Thank you. So most appropriate antiarrhythmic drug, 57-year-old female cirrhosis, PAF, paroxysmal AFib, no structural heart disease, normal renal function. All right. Looks like we still have a few more knowledge gaps. So I'm going to introduce next Dr. Peter Noseworthy. Dr. Noseworthy is a professor of medicine. He is an electrophysiologist. He is the director of our heart rhythm and physiologic monitoring lab, does a lot of work in the space of artificial intelligence and um, interpretation of electrocardiograms. He gives a really nice overview of antiarrhythmic medications, not only their mechanism of action, but also their clinical applicability. So Dr. Noseworthy, take it away. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, this is one of those topics that I think causes a lot of trepidation on the boards. Uh, unless you're using these medicines on a daily basis, uh, most people are not terribly familiar with them, and it can be daunting. We're not even used to prescribing them, let alone some of the nitty gritty. So I've thought a lot about how to put this lecture together. We've, and we could go through drug by drug, and I could give you all the details about each drug. But instead, what I'd like to do is try to teach just about two or three key principles. And if you understand these key principles, you can anchor the knowledge of the drugs to those concepts, and everything else kinds of, kind of falls into place. And you'll see that there are a number of different concepts, and they're all interrelated. So if you understand the mechanism of action, you'll then be able to understand the mechanism of proarrhythmia. If you understand use dependence and reverse use dependence, you know how these drugs are applied in clinical practice and how they're monitored and so forth. So it's really not terribly complicated to understand the key principles, and that's what I want you to try to take away from the lecture today. Just before your exam, you can go through and look at all of the drug-drug interactions and some of the idiosyncrasies of the medications themselves, just to keep that information fresh in mind. But uh, today is all about the key concepts. There are only two learning objectives for today's talk. I'll talk about uh, how to identify the classification and mechanism of action of the antiarrhythmic drugs. That's really the key. And then from that, we'll talk about um, how that relates to toxicity, interactions, metabolism, and how all that comes together in terms of selecting the right drug for an individual clinical scenario. The talk will be divided into five uh, sections. I'll talk about classification, which is based on the mechanism of action, and then I'll talk about proarrhythmia. Then I'll talk about the concepts of use and reverse use dependency and state dependency. Then we'll talk briefly about uh, metabolism inter interactions, and then at the end, we'll try to put all that information together and talk about selecting the right drug for the right patient in the right clinical scenario. So first, mechanism of action. <clears throat> 
So you've already heard a fair amount about this today from Dr. Ackerman, but as you know, uh, there's high intracellular potassium, high extracellular sodium, and as a result, there's a negative charge and electrochemical gradient in the cell. The initiation of the action potential is related to opening of, of sodium channels and an inward current of sodium. There's then a notch, which is a transient outward potassium current, which sort of corrects that. And then there's a plateau phase, which, during which time uh, potassium and calcium currents are balanced. And then potassium currents, which are outward, uh, make up the repolarization current and reset the membrane. So really, all of these drugs that we're going to talk about today either affect that initial phase zero, which is sodium channel dependent, or repolarization, which is potassium dependent. Antiarrhythmic drugs have been classified at, by a number of different uh, taxonomies, if you will, but the most commonly used and the most clinically useful is the Von Williams classification. And it's relatively straightforward. There's four classes, but we're really only interested in two classes. Class one, which are sodium channels, and class three, which are the potassium channel blockers. Class one agents are the sodium channel blockers. As a result of blocking sodium channels, they slow conduction because that's what initiates that action potential. They blunt that phase zero of the action potential. They result in QRS prolongation, and that's sort of their mechanism of, of uh, antiarrhythmic drug action by slowing conduction. In contrast, the class three agents, the potassium channel blockers, uh, uh, delay repolarization and lengthen the action potential. As a result, the tissue is more refractory because of the action potential duration. And those are the drugs that result in QT prolongation. You can think about a long action potential being reflected on the 12 lead ECG as QT prolongation. Now, that was a generic action potential, but there's a little bit of variation based on the cell type within the heart. So nodal tissue, and I mean the AV node or the SA node, does not have the same concentration of sodium channels. And as a result, that phase zero is relatively blunt. But the important thing is that the sodium channel blockers then don't affect nodal tissue. So we don't use sodium channel blockers to block the AV node or to affect automaticity. In fact, instead, they act on the rest of the myocardium in terms of impulse propagation. The atrial myocyte has a particularly short action potential because there's another potassium channel here, the IKACH uh, uh, channel, and that results in a short action potential in the atrium. And it's why the atria are so prone to arrhythmias, because there's opportunities for local reentry, because that tissue is relatively uh, less refractory in comparison to other tissues. The Purkinje fiber actually has a longer action potential duration, and the reason is that we don't want to get reentry into the Purkinje tissue. If we did, we'd end up with things like fascicular VT that you heard about this morning from Dr. Mulperu. And then the endocardium, midmyocardium, and endocardium has a slight variation in action potential duration, as well as that uh, notching. And that's what creates a potential for a dispersion of repolarization, and that's what becomes the substrate for torsade de point, or sort of twisting of an electrical impulse through the myocardium. So class one agents, sodium channel blockers, affect phase zero of the action potential. As a result, they blunt that, and they result in QRS, not QT, prolongation. That's the most simple way to think of sodium channel blockers, of course, but there are some idiosyncrasies and there are other drugs with sort of mixed effects. So when I think about a, a class one agent, I'm typically thinking about flecainide or propafenone, and these are class one C agents, which are quite specific in their effect in, in terms of affecting the sodium channel. As a result, these are the ones that we'll monitor by looking at the QRS duration, and they have very little effect, if any at all, on the uh, QT interval itself. Lidocaine and its orally bioavailable version, mexilatine, have relatively little effect in normal myocardium on either phase zero or on repolarization. And as a result, they're not terribly pro-arrhythmic because they don't mess with normal electrophysiologic machinery in the same way. But they have a particular pro proclivity to injured or ischemic or slightly depolarized myocardium. And that's why we reach for lidocaine in the setting of uh, polymorphic VT, for instance, occurring in the context of myocardial ischemia in the CCU. And you've all done that many times. The oddest uh, class one grouping are class one A agents, quinidine, procainamide, disopyramide, and to some extent, 
amiodarone. And all of these actually have mixed effects, both on phase zero, but also on repolarization. And it's a little hard to remember this, but if you remember these little stories, you might be able to anchor that knowledge. So quinidine, you may recall hearing about how quinidine used to be titrated until people started getting syncope. And the reason they got syncope was they were actually developing torsade from QT prolongation. So we don't do that in practice these days, but if you look at the ancient medical li literature, that was the way it was dosed. So think about syncope with quinidine due to torsade. That'll tell you that it also has that class three effect. Similarly, procainamide can sometimes cause torsade in patients in the ICU who have renal failure, for instance. And it's because procainamide is acetylated in the liver to n procainamide or NAPA, and that uh, metabolite is renally cleared. If somebody has renal failure, it can accumulate, and you can get a toxicity that looks like a class three agent with torsade, QT prolongation, et cetera. And then disopyramide, similar effects. It's uh, somewhat negatively inotrope, so it has a niche indication in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who have had atrial fibrillation, because it may help with rhythm control as well as uh, relieve some of the obstruction. On to the class three agents. They don't do anything for phase zero, but they affect potassium channels, in particular the IKR uh, channel, and that is just like having long QT2, as you heard from Dr. Ackerman this morning, but they result in QT prolongation, and that can set up for proarrhythmia with torsade. So let's talk about, now that you know the mechanism of action of those two general classes, let's talk about how those can result in proarrhythmia. So proarrhythmia is just defined as new or more frequent arrhythmia precipitated by an antiarrhythmic drug action. And there are three basic types of proarrhythmia. The first is what we'll see in patients on sodium channel blockers, that slow conduction. And these drugs can actually promote reentry because the slower the wavefront is propagating, the more prone it is to snake its way around a scar and complete a loop and cause a reentrant rhythm. So if you see a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia in somebody who's on flecainide, think about proarrhythmia from these medicines. And that's the reason, actually, that there's a black box warning against the use of flecainide or propafenone in anybody who's had a prior myocardial infarction or scar. The second example are drugs that prolong repolarization. They work by making the tissue more refractory, but it comes at a cost of the risk of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or torsade, which is simply polymorphic VT in the context of long QT. And these are related to triggered early after depolarizations. So what happens is some of those uh, sodium channels have actually recovered late uh, um, in that early repolarization phase. And if they're available to be excited and there's a little bit of dispersion of repolarization, some of those myocardi myocardial regions are going to still be at threshold and it's going to cause ectopy. So you may see short coupled PVCs as a harbinger of impending torsade. And that's the toxicity of class three agents. This is less important for antiarrhythmic drugs, but it's the third mechanism of proarrhythmia and it's uh, calcium overload or triggered uh, uh, delayed after depolarizations. And you heard about this this morning when we were talking about CPVT with Dr. Ackerman, but high intracellular calcium can cause increased automaticity, and then increased automaticity on the fascicles can cause this sort of alternating um, bundle branch block pattern or biventricular ventricular tachycardia. But it's a very different mechanism of action than uh, what we see with early after depolarizations because the treatments are opposite. I'll get into this a little bit later, but if you want to treat uh, proarrhythmia that's related to increased uh, refractoriness of the tissue and long QT, you may want to pace the heart fast in order to shorten that QT interval. Whereas if somebody has CPVT, the last thing you want to do is load the heart with additional calcium. It'll precipitate VT storm, and that's why um, we're so cautious putting in ICDs in that population. So let's talk about the mechanism of reentry. As long as a propagating wavefront comes up against excitable tissue, it will propagate forever. An analogy I like to think about is a dog chasing its tail in the backyard. As long as it can't get its mouth all the way around to its tail, it's going to keep going. It'll never catch that tail, and it becomes an incessant uh, tachycardia. Uh, but if we either slow conduction or we increase repolarization, we can in influence uh, that proarrhythmia. So that distance between the snout and the tail is so-called excitable gap. 
all of this tissue here that's excitable and presents an opportunity to engage in that reentrant circuit. So it'll go around and around and around like this uh, until the dog gets tired. If we prolong repolarization, we make the action potential longer and it shrinks that excitable gap. So then that opportunity to get into that circuit is less because the tissue is more refractory and that PVC has to be perfectly timed or that PAC in order to engage in that kind of circuit. And if the excitable gap or the repolarization gets long enough, it could actually extinguish the excitable gap altogether and the arrhythmia would, would uh, terminate. The class one agents uh, will actually slow the propagation of this reentrant circuit. And as a result, it opens up an enormous excitable gap. So this is why they're pro-arrhythmia. I'm basically telling you the same concepts over and over from slightly different approaches. But slow conduction, a very large excitable gap and potential for pro-arrhythmia. So this makes sense intuitively uh, once you understand the mechanism, but there are also good clinical trial data to support that. Nobody talks about antiarrhythmic drugs without mentioning the CAST trial, but it's a very old trial, but it really changed practice in cardiology and electrophysiology. So we know that after a myocardial infarction, there's lots of ventricular ectopy. It would make sense that suppressing that ectopy might reduce the risk of more sustained ventricular arrhythmias and uh, prevent sudden cardiac death. This was tested in a trial with medications that are very good at suppressing ectopy, uh, flecainide and enconide in this case. But unfortunately, they increase proarrhythmia, increase mortality, presumably due to monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And ever since this time, there's been the black box warning against the use of these medications. So drugs that prolong repolarization typically have an initiation sequence of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that looks like this. So here's a patient in sinus bradycardia. You can see that that early after depolarization is happening on the terminal component of the T wave in that, in that area where some of those uh, sodium channels are recovering, but there's still some depolarized myocardium boom, it causes a PVC. That PVC then causes a compensatory pause, and that compensatory pause further exacerbates the problem of, long, of QT prolongation, and the next QT is a little longer. There's another PVC, even longer, until it sets up an opportunity for reentry, and that's what we're seeing here. So you've got your action potential, IKR is affected, uh, long QT, and then torsade as that impulse uh, goes across the dispersion of repolarization across the epicardium, midmyocardium, and endocardium, and creates this like a, like a spinning top. And we know that uh, also from clinical trials, there's a nice trial called the SWORD trial that looked at suppression of arrhythmia with desodolol after myocardial infarction, and again, it showed a potential for proarrhythmia. The caveat here is that this tested desodolol. In practice, we use a racemic mix, uh, mixture of uh, D and L sotolol, um, but uh, um, uh, it, which has both beta blocking effect as well as antiarrhythmic drug effect. It may somewhat neutralize this effect, but we know at least that there's a potential for proarrhythmia with these medications. And then that last example of proarrhythmia are delayed after depolarizations. These are not occurring at the end of the T wave, but rather here in uh, phase, um, in, in sort of this, uh, uh, between the T wave and the next P wave. And this is the so-called uh, uh, delayed after depolarizations that we see in conditions like um, uh, CPV, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, and digoxin toxicity. They're related to high intracellular calcium. This is the mechanism of action of uh, digoxin toxicity, or CPVT. So in digoxin, the drug actually affects the uh, potassium sodium exchanger which results in high intracellular sodium, which in turn inhibits the sodium calcium exchanger and results in high intracellular calcium. High intracellular calcium increases automaticity, so you may see uh, um, things related to increased automaticity. If you're hypokalemic, this whole cascade is accentuated, so digoxin toxicity is made worse by hypokalemia, and severe digoxin toxicity can actually result in hyperkalemia. In CPVT, the calcium is not coming uh, through the extracellular membrane, but actually coming from intracellular calcium stores within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, all that calcium that has been stored and sequestered into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's mediated here by a, a tonic leakiness 
of the ryanidine receptor. And this is why, as you heard this morning from Dr. Ackerman, that we can stabilize the ryanidine receptor on the sarcoplasmic reticulum with drugs like flecainide, and they may have a niche indication in conditions like CPVT. Bidirectional ventricular tachycardia would be the hallmark uh, uh, proarrhythmic effect of high intracellular calcium related to digoxin or CPVT, but you're just as likely in digoxin toxicity to, to see things like high-grade AV block, which is related to the high vagal tone related to the medication, or other signs of increased automaticity like an accelerated junctional rhythm or an atrial tachycardia with high-grade AV block and an escape rhythm. Um, but if you see it on the boards of bidirectional ventricular tachycardia, think delayed after depolarization. So that's what they're going for. So let's just do a quick check. I'll show you a few ECGs. Tell me what is the mechanism of proarrhythmia here. Well, looking at this ECG, is this related to slowed conduction and reentry? prolonged repolarization with early after depolarizations, or calcium overload with delayed after depolarizations. Good. So this is an example of prolonged repolarization. In fact, you can see that the QT interval um, looks pretty long. The only one you can really see here, but the T wave's flat. There's the T wave all the way out there. And then we have these PVCs that are falling on the terminal component of the T wave. That's the sort of early repolarization um, uh, time for EADs. And then it's triggering these salvos of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. How about this ECG? What does this demonstrate? Is this related to slowed conduction and reentry, EADs, or DADs? You may have seen the CCG earlier today, I'm not certain. Great, even better. So this is bidirectional ventricular tachycardia uh, caused by high, high uh, calcium state and delayed after depolarizations. And lastly, let's round it out. What are we seeing here? Yeah, you're voting quickly, and I won't belabor the point. Um, I suspect you'll do well on this. But yeah, so slowed conduction and reentry. This is a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia related to proarrhythmia, like we saw in CAST, and a class one agent like flecainide or, or propathenone. Okay, so that's the mechanism of action and proarrhythmia. The next key idea to understand are the concepts of use dependency and state dependency. And this has a lot to do with how we dose and monitor these drugs. So the uh, receptors uh, or the channels um, exist in three states, the rested, the activated, or the inactive form. And there's different rate constants for drug binding based on the state of the channel. And as a result, drugs that preferentially bind to recently engaged channels will have more effect the faster the heart rate, because the more those channels are turning over, the more drug binding you see you'll see just the opposite effect, and that's called use, reverse use dependency with drugs that bind uh, 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 during bradycardia. So the thing to understand here is that use-dependent channel block is, a, is, is commonly seen in sodium channel blockers. They have greatest effect at faster heart rates, and the exact opposite is true for the class three agent for uh, potassium channel blockers, which are dem generally demonstrate reverse use dependence. So this is the slide uh, to think of when you're thinking about the use-dependent effects and why this is important clinically. So as I said, these drugs, sodium channel blockers, demonstrate use-dependent effects. They have greatest effect at fast heart rates. That's the reason that we'll use a drug like this as a pill-in-the-pocket agent. So if you think about somebody who's in atrial fibrillation, their atrial rate is through the roof. So the drug that you're giving them will have maximum effect on the atrial myocardium when they're actually in atrial fibrillation. It will slow conduction, it may organize the rhythm and ultimately terminate it. So we use class 1C agents as pill-in-the-pocket drugs, flecainide and propafenone, but you've never told a patient to take dofetilide pill-in-the-pocket. You wouldn't do that because it really has maximum effect when they're actually in atrial fibrillation. Um, we also see the greatest degree of QRS prolongation when the heart rate is fast. 
So if you had a patient who had a heart rate of 60, their QRS duration on flecainide may look normal. But if you really want to stress the heart and see their potential for proarrhythmia, you'd want to get their heart rate up. You may do a stress test and look at QRS prolongation. Lastly, this is the reason that you can see a wide complex supraventricular tachycardia in people who are treated with flecainide. So just imagine you have somebody who's in atrial fibrillation, you give them pill in the pocket flecainide, it organizes their atrial fibrillation into atrial flutter, and because they're on flecainide, that flutter is not nearly as fast as a typical flutter, so it slows down a little bit. As a result, it doesn't conduct two to one to the ventricle, but it conducts one to one to the ventricle. So their rate is not 150, but it might be 225 or something like that, or it might be 280, it could be very fast. Not only that, when the ventricular rate is 280, they get that use-dependent effect on the ventricular myocardium and the QRS widens. So we sort of colloquially call this sort of a flecka flutter kind of thing, where they're in flutter and it looks like VT, it's a wide complex tachycardia, it can be very fast, can cause syncope, and it's sort of the toxicity that you'll see in relatively young, otherwise healthy people who are taking high doses of flecainide or taking it as a pill-in-the-pocket drug. So here's an example. This patient was in FIB. We gave them uh, flecainide. It organized their FIB to atrial flutter. You can see the flutter waves. There's just a subtle R prime there in V1, just a little bit of RV conduction delay. And then they got up and they exercised on a treadmill and they conducted one-to-one -one and they ended up with a wide complex rhythm. So you can do a stress test. Prolong, um, that, that will prolong the QRS uh, duration. If you see it greater than 25%, stop the drug or reduce the dose. And you want to see a little bit of QRS prolongation because you want to make sure the drug is working. So 10% or something is perfectly reasonable. But once you see bundle branch block, heart block, or uh, excess prolongation up to 25% of the QRS duration, back off or stop the drug altogether. I alluded to this uh, earlier on, but uh, class 1B agents like like uh, lidocaine, are not use-dependent, uh, so they don't have that same effect, but they are state-dependent. So in ischemic myocardium, they have more effect than they do in, my, in, in relatively normal myocardium. As a result, we use these drugs in patients with ischemic uh, ventricular arrhythmias, and they have really rapid kinetics in normal myocardium, so they tend not to be terribly pro-arrhythmic um, outside of that uh, uh, scenario. Now, class three agents demonstrate reverse use dependency. That's just the exact opposite of what I'm talking about. They have the most, what I was talking about before with use dependency, they have the most effect at slow heart rates. The reason is a little bit complicated. It may be beyond the boards, but I'll do my best to explain it here. There are two repolarization currents mediated through IKS, which is slowly activating and unactivating unacti as slower kinetics, and IKR, which is rapid. Be at faster heart rates, the effect of IKS, because of its slow kinetics, accumulates. And at faster rates, IKS is a more dominant repolarization current in comparison to IKR. Because most of the drugs that cause pro uh, QT prolongation are IKR blockers, they don't really have much effect at faster heart rates because it's rescued by IKS. At slower heart rates, IKS and IKR both contribute equally to repolarization, and patients are vulnerable to QT prolongation from IKR blockers. So this is the sort of summary slide on that as well. So the class three agents, sotalol, dofetilide, have greatest effect on slow heart rates. So we don't use it as pill in the pocket, but they're great for maintenance of sinus rhythm. So we use it a lot in people with persistent AFib who we cardiovert, get them back to normal rhythm, and we hope that sotalol or dofetilide is what it's gonna to take to keep them in normal rhythm. Uh, they're good for maintenance, and it means that when we monitor the drug, we're looking at the QT interval, and we're looking at rest. The QT interval is not as useful if somebody's in AFib at a rate of 140 beats a minute. So you really do want to cardiovert those patients, get a sense of what their baseline rate is, and measure the QT interval in sinus rhythm. Um, and it's also the reason that there's a p potential for proarrhythmia when people are bradycardic. So we tend not to treat patients with dofetilide, and then high-dose beta blocker on top of it. Because if they convert from fib to, to sinus bradycardia and they're very slow, they're going to have a lot of that drug effect and they're going to be prone to arrhythmias. It's also the reason that almost every phone call I've gotten over the years about Torsad in one of these patients starting these drugs comes in the middle of the night. Because when patients are up and walking around, they may have a heart rate of 60, but maybe they've got sleep apnea and they get these wanky box cycles and they brady down at night and 
when they do that, they get excess QT prolongation and a potential for proarrhythmia. So when I think about that, I think about that middle of the night phone call that anchors me to bradycardia, reverse use dependence. I think it's a good way for your boards to think about this knowledge and put it all together. And that's the initiation sequence we've talked so much about. And it's why we have to avoid excess rate slowing with these medications. Amiodarone, as you've heard many times, is less proarrhythmic than other medications, and it's because it affects IKS and IKR equally, so it has equal effect across a range of heart rates, and it tends to uh, uh, cause these arrhythmias much less frequently, even though it sort of falls into many different classes as an antiarrhythmic drug. So here's the summary. Class one agents, sodium channel blockers. Sodium channel blockers, slow conduction. That's how they help with arrhythmias. Problem is, if you go too far, you'll promote re-entry, and it's just the opposite. You get proarrhythmia. And they have use-dependent effect, so they're pill-in-the-pocket agents. Class three agents are potassium channel blockers. They make the tissue more refractory by prolonging repolarization. They result in long QT, but they can cause early after depolarization and torsad and reverse use dependency. When you get that phone call, it's at night when they're bradycardic. So let me take a couple minutes to talk about metabolism and drug interactions. Here's a question. I alluded to this in one of the first slides. A patient develops torsade shortly after uh, starting procainamide in the ICU. What is the likely cause? You'll say, procainamide, I thought that was a class 1 agent, class 1A. What's going on? Why is there torsade? Is it failure to acetylate uh, NAPA due to liver failure? Is it accumulation of NAPA due to liver failure? Is it accumulation of NAPA due to a renal failure, or is it a SCN5A common variant predisposing to arrhythmias? Great. That's sort of a rapid recall question, because I did mention that in one of the first slides. I haven't, you know, I've been dosing these drugs for a while. I haven't come across that. We always monitor NAPA levels, but it's the kind of thing that is testable. It tests your ability to understand the metabolism, the uh, uh, excretion of the metabolites, and the potential for proarrhythmia. So it's a nice board question, regardless of how often it comes up in clinical practice. It's important to know the major routes of elimination of antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, think about the drugs that are renally cleared, are sotalol and dofetilide, and of course, digoxin. We always monitor DIG levels in people with renal failure or use it more cautiously. And if you're starting sotalol or dofetilide in the hospital, you're always checking kidney function first. In fact, the pharmacy at Mayo won't allow us to dispense the medicine until we've documented the kidney function. So those drugs, I think, are relatively easy to remember. The hepatic drugs, of course, amiodarone. And then you, you've seen patients maybe who became toxic on lidocaine who were in cardiogenic shock. And the reason is they have poor hepatic perfusion when they're in shock. And as a result, they don't clear the lidocaine and a couple boluses for polymorphic VT, and all of a sudden their ears are ringing or they're having uh, various sim uh, symptoms. And then verapamil and diltiazem are sort of on that list of cytochrome P450 related uh, drugs. You can remember it that way. And then the rest are mixed. So flecainide, procainamide with that NAPA, caveat, quinidine, and ibutaline. Um, here's a potential scenario for toxicity of these medications. You have a patient who you start on um, propafenone, and shortly after doing so, they develop uh, sort of this bradycardia and QRS prolongation. They look toxic on the drug. And the reason is uh, about 7% of the population are slow metabolizers due to their CYP, uh, 2D6 uh, genotype. And uh, that means that they'll be very sensitive to propafenone or anything within the class, including flecainide. So if you saw something like this and it said, what's the next drug, what do you switch to? Switch out of the class to another agent. Don't switch to flecainide. There are two cytochrome P450 enzymes to be aware of, CYP2D6, and that's what I just talked about with propafenone, flecainide, mixilatine falls into that category, and then 3A4 for amiodarone and dofetilide. It's probably worth uh, putting a sticky note on this and looking at this just before the, uh, uh, the boards. There are several drug interactions to be aware of with amiodarone, uh, and it can affect uh, warfarin metabolism, digoxin, or even transplant medications. We have to be careful about co-administration of class three agents or class 1A agents with other QT prolonging meds. So be aware of the other classes of medications that prolong the QT, and they cannot be used uh, together. So now let's circle back and try to talk about selecting the best drug based on a clinical scenario. <clears throat> 
So for atrial fibrillation, the first question I ask is, is there structural heart disease or not? If there's no structural heart disease, all the agents are on the table. We typically use flecainide or propafenone first for paroxysmal AFib, sotalol maybe for, uh, per, uh, for persistent AFib, and then second line agents would be dofetilide or amiodarone due to toxicities and the need for inpatient uh, initiation with dofetilide. If they have coronary artery disease, we worry about the potential of proarrhythmia with flecainide and propafenone, so we have to use a class three agent instead. We used sotalol or dofetilide and then amiodarone as second line. And if they have heart failure, we generally want to avoid the, the negative inotropic effects of sotalol, and we'll use instead dofetilide or amiodarone. So I try to think about an individual patient I've taken care of in order to anchor that knowledge. So the typical patient for a class 1C agent is somebody who has relatively few comorbidities. They have paroxysmal AFib, they're highly symptomatic, and they have no structural heart disease or particular propensity towards ventricular tachycardia. The class three agents, you can use people who have some degree of structural heart disease, prior myocardial infarction, maybe even a little bit of a low ejection fraction. You can still use dofetilide, but they have to have normal renal function. They have to use the drugs carefully and take it relatively consistently. You can't double up or skip a dose or there's a potential for arrhythmia. And although we use amiodarone generally as our third line agent, it can be very effective in people with multiple comorbidities, particularly if atrial fibrillation is causing recurrent hospitalizations or heart failure exacerbations. For ventricular tachycardia, we think about is the same thing. Is there structural heart disease or not? If there's structural heart disease and it's a monomorphic arrhythmia, it means it's re-entrant. And that can be things like coronary disease, SCAR, ARVC, sarcoid. In that case, we treat with beta blockers, amiodarone, sotalol, but we avoid the class 1C agents. If it's polymorphic, they're probably ischemic. That's when we reach for lidocaine or beta blockers to help with the ischemia. If they have a normal heart, but a monomorphic arrhythmia, these tend to be benign arrhythmias that you heard about this morning from Dr. Mulperu, RVOT tachycardia, fascicular tachycardia, and they may be treated with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. If it's polymorphic VT in a normal heart, that's the Ackerman lecture. So beta blockers for long QT, flecainide for CPVT, and quinidine for Brugada syndrome. It's important to be aware of some of these dosing considerations. So we look at the QRS duration in uh, people on 1C. We'll look at QT prolongation at three months or periodically in people on dofetilide or sotalol. Amiodarone has a whole litany of uh, associated toxicities that you should be aware of, and they require active monitoring uh, we tend not to see a lot of people getting into problem these days if we're treating with the lowest possible dose and being vigilant. But the time people get into trouble is when it's prescribed and the patient is lost to follow up and they come back five years later still on a high dose of amiodarone with, and with evidence of toxicities. So in your syllabus, I made some drug summaries, and you can use these almost as flashcards as you're reviewing. It goes through the mechanism of action and all of the toxicities and some of those idiosyncrasies about each drug. I think it's worth, once you're comfortable with the concepts, going through that slide by slide and making sure that it all fits together. I won't go through that today. So the key points, understand the classification is based on antiarrhythmic drug action. Understand that that also predisposes to various forms of proarrhythmia. Think about all drugs as either having use dependence or reverse use dependence, and then how that affects whether we're monitoring during sinus rhythm or with a stress test, and whether we're using it for pill in the pocket or for maintenance of an arrhythmia or of, a, of normal rhythm. Be aware of some of the uh, metabolic considerations, and then put all that information together to try to identify uh, the right drug for the right patient in the right clinical scenario. So Michael, hand it over. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Noseworthy. Go ahead and have a seat here. Let's move to the audience response questions. We'll see how people did. All right. So which of the following is a characteristic of the class three agents? Slow impulse conduction velocity and exhibit reverse use-dependent effect. Prolonged refractoriness and exhibit use-dependent effect. Slow impulse conduction velocity and exhibit use-dependent effect and then prolong refractoriness and exhibit reverse use-dependent effect. Let's see if we have a knowledge lift. 
78%. And how did that compare to what we saw beforehand? Very nice lift. So this, um, some of it is you know it or you don't. As you, as our fellows and the, the people taking the recertification exam prepare for their boards, do you have a good way that people can remember this refractoriness, reverse use dependence, something that sort of you go to or sticks in your head or, or a learning tool that you can tell people that they can use as, as they're studying this material? Yeah, I, so it w if you were to go through every drug and try to memorize use dependent, reverse use dependent, state dependent, yeah. state independent, it would be overwhelming, especially right. since you're not doing that all the time. Right. So really, it, it's based on the class. So there's only two things to remember. It's that the sodium channels are use dependent and it's a reverse for the potassium channel blockers. That's all you need to know. Okay. And the way I remember is what I alluded to during the test, the, the lecture was think about that bradycardic patient with torsad. Mm -hmm. And then think about the stress test with the rapid heart rate and wide complex rhythm QRS prolongation. Okay. So those are the clinical corollaries of that. And those are the only two things you need to remember. Just think about putting somebody on a stress test and seeing wide complex tachycardia and everybody freaking out. And then think about everybody freaking out in the middle of the night when they get the phone call about torsad and the patient's bradycardic with sleep apnea. Gotcha. So just remember those scenarios. You should be able to remember it. Perfect. And don't get overwhelmed going through the flashcards at the end. So just base it on class. Is it yeah. sodium channels class one? Is it potassium channels class three? Is yeah. it going to work at I think if you look at this question yes. and you hadn't gone through that and you didn't already know it, you'd just say... I'm going to skip this and get right. this question wrong exactly. on the exam. But it's really not that hard. Exactly. There's no need. You should get it right. So um, ab about these class three agents, so you nicely outlined sort, sort of the monitoring that you use for sodalol and dofetilide and, and amiodarone. The question often comes up, okay, I want to start someone on dofetilide. I want to start someone on sodalol. I want to start someone on amiodarone. Do I need to put them in the hospital? What are the circumstances yeah. that you're going to hospitalize a patient to initiate an antiarrhythmic medication? Yeah, I think the general practice, there is some variation. I'll acknowledge that, mm -hmm. especially for sodalol. And there are some, I can talk about some caveats. But sure. in general, for the boards, if they're asking you the question, they're trying to be cautious. So hospitalize patients for sodalol and dofetilide. We sometimes hospitalize for amiodarone, but it's usually because somebody's in refractory VT and getting ICD shocks. It's not really for the drug because okay. it's not as proarrhythmic. Amiodarone is not as proarrhythmic in the same way. So if I'm starting amiodarone, I, I'll often do it as an outpatient unless I have an indication independent of that for hospitalization. Okay. Um, if somebody, you know, if somebody has a, an ICD already and they're paced at 60, then there's less potential for reverse use dependence. Yeah. So, and you're gonna start Sotolol at low dose and they have an ICD already. You know, those are the kinds of situations where some people will get away with it. The reason I mentioned that is not to say get away with it on the, on the board exam, right. but just to think about why they're doing that. And it all hangs together mechanistically. Right, because you're not gonna push their heart rate lower Right. which is the point at which the prorhythmic effects yes. are going to kick in. Yeah, not to say the sodalol can't be proarrhythmic or they could get renal failure or something like that. And you would want to check that before starting sodalol. Gotcha. But, yeah, I, I hospitalize most people for sodalol or, or dofetilide. Okay, but and then the 1C agents, propafenone and flecainide. No, you don't need to. Okay. Um, if you're going to do pill in the pocket at high dose, there's that potential that you organize fib to flutter and then flutter slow and you conduct one-to-one. -one or that you have uh, sinus node dysfunction that you weren't aware of and somebody has a long conversion pause. So the general recommendation would be to give that first dose of pill-in-the-pocket drug in an observed setting of some sort, ideally on a monitor. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a lot to send somebody to the emergency department uh, for, for their first dose of flecainide, but I don't think that would be on the boards, but th that would be the reason to do that. Gotcha, gotcha. And we actually had a question come in on the um, portal about this mechanism of converting AFib to a flutter. How does that happen, in, and 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 how should the the attendees think about it? Well, um, I mean, you could get into the mathematical modeling right. of sort of stochastic events yeah. in the atrium, but and that would be something that I is a little beyond me. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, we, don't, we don't need to go down. So that let road. me give you an analogy. Yeah. If, um, if you have chaotic activity in the, in the atrium, it's almost like a hot tub with the jets on full. Yeah. Colliding wave fronts, white water, twisting eddy currents, and it's, there's no discernible pattern there. But if you turn those jets down, you slow conduction with an agent like flecainide, then what you'll get is a, is a, is a more organized rhythm. 
So you're basically taking all of these colliding uh, wave fronts, you're slowing them down, and then a prevailing sort of current happens until it settles into a flutter. Yeah. I love the whirlpool analogy. Yeah. We'll have to think, I'll have to tell my pa patients about that next yeah. time. Maybe we need a whirlpool here at the CV board review sure. to get people to come back next year. We can sort of do that. At the, yeah. yeah, great idea. Hot tub time machine. Yes, exactly. Next year. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then one other question about the um, class 1C agents. Do you have a dealer's, is it dealer's choice, propafenone or flecainide, or do you have one that you prefer? No, I think it's other? dealer's choice. Okay. Um, I tend to use flecainide more often than propafenone. Okay. Um, you know, one important thing that I actually didn't mention in the, in the lecture, but it's actually very important, it's, it's a very testable thing, is if you're giving flecainide, give it with a beta blocker uh, okay. to avoid that one-to-one -one, uh, conduction. So when we see people in trouble, it's often pill in the pocket, because in pill in the pocket, that beta blocker is often a forgotten part of the cocktail. So it's actually two pills in the pocket. Then. Yeah. Is that how you do it? So yeah. they have to take the, how, so how do you tell a patient practically to do that? So say you want the otherwise healthy young patient, 30 some years old, paroxysmal AFib, don't want to have to go into the hospital. They've demonstrated that it's safe. Yes. Do you give them a, how do you, how do you manage? It gives a beta blocker about half an hour ahead. Yeah. Um, and what, do you have a preferred beta blocker? No, but you could use a short-acting beta blocker. Like metoprolol tartrate yeah, or something. Tartrate like, and just a low dose should suffice. Yeah, I think 25 milligrams or so. Perfect. Perfect. All right, let's go to the next question. What is the most appropriate antiarrhythmic drug for a 57-year-old female with cirrhosis and paroxysmal AFib, but no structural heart disease and normal renal function? Flecainide, propafenone, amiodarone, quinidine, or sodalol? Sodalol. All right. Do you want to talk about this? Let's see how people did mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Me. So with normal renal function, sodalol is still inappropriate um, because it's purely renally cleared. It does not involve hepatic uh, metabolism at all. Um, Flecainide uh, is, a, is affected by both uh, liver and kidney function. This is just sort of one of those review it and uh, know it for the exam. The um, you know, if one caveat here is that cirrhotic patients sometimes have some degree of baseline QT prolongation, which can sensitize them to sotalol. Maybe a, that may be why some people are pushed away from that uh, answer, but it looks like there was a lift there, um, and okay. uh, that's correct. Excellent. All right, so let's just go to our, we have a bonus question here. We'll go to that, um, we'll do the bonus question, and then we'll come back to some of these other audience questions. So bonus question, which you haven't seen this yet. Which of the following is effective for treating polymorphic ventricular tachycardia occurring in the setting of triggered activity and delayed after depolarizations? Isoproteranol, temporary cardiac pacing, calcium channel or beta blocker, or sodium bicarbonate? Try to get to about 140. Calcium channel blocker. So do you want to explain why calcium channel blocker is going to be the correct answer here? Yeah. So I think that the people who have put option one or two are thinking about early after depolarizations and QT prolongation for medications, and they're trying to make an effort to increase the heart rate, shorten repolarization, and extinguish torsad. And the difference here is that with delayed after depolarizations, we're actually talking about a high intracellular calcium state. So that, remember, was DIG toxicity or CPVT. CPVT yep. So... Um, if you were to uh, give isoproteranol, a potent catecholamine, to CPVT, you'd actually exacerbate the problem. So both one and two actually exacerbate the problem here. We don't want to overdrive pace dig toxicity either, even though sometimes they need a wire because of profound bradycardia. Um, so instead, we want to we want to blunt that effect, um, and calcium channel blocker or beta blocker would be the the drug that you would use in that situation. So that's the final common pathway of these delayed after depolarizations is excessive yeah. intracellular calcium. Yeah, and then flecainide, uh, I think you heard from Ackerman about its effect on the ryanidine receptor and sort of that niche indication 
for reducing sarcoplasmic reticulum cal mediated calcium release. Excellent. So this is a question about delayed after depolarization. So we had a question come in um, on the portal about early after depolarization. So we hear all the time about this R on T phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Is that an example of a delayed after depolarization? Yeah, you probably it can be. I mean, you could have you could have other PVCs related to other causes. So sometimes a PVC, it's not important for the boards, but it could be reentrant if you have scar that that impulse sort of gets in the scar and causes an auto automatic beat. Mm -hmm. And then the timing could be the same just by chance. Just by coincidence. But if it's a but if it's a triggered effect, uh, that that really is probably an EAD manifestation. And it's that EAD that causes the pause and more QT and et cetera, and then you're off to the races. Off to the races, yeah. gotcha. Um, we had another question come in going back to the class 1C antiarrhythmics. So um, when you put a patient on flaconide or propafenone for paroxysmal AFib, how do you monitor that like one week later? Do you get a resting ECG? Do you go to a um, ECG plus and a treadmill test or do you do something else? Yeah, I think the important thing is to look because what you don't want to do is, is just ignore it altogether. Right. So in my practice, uh, it's about 50-50. If somebody has a baseline QRS, they have an incomplete right bundle, for instance, and then they're in your, you want to see a little bit of QRS prolongation with the drug, and it just pushes it up to kind of right bundle territory, that's a patient I would do the stress test in without a doubt. Gotcha. Um, in, in somebody who has a narrow QRS and there's modest QT prolong or QRS prolongation with the drug, uh, as long as you've checked it at steady state about a week later, you're, you're probably okay. Um, the reason a lot of people are doing stress tests is you kill two birds with one stone in terms of right. also trying to exclude uh, uh, infarct, prior infarct. Gotcha. And, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and the, all of those flashcards, they were in your slides, correct? The, those drug Yeah, I just hid them on hit the them talk because I, 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 we would never make it through the lecture if I went through them all. One question came in about lidocaine. Can you use um, lidocaine to reduce the QTC interval to prevent torsades? And I'm presuming this is talking about, you know, potentially, um, well, maybe there's a few different situations. So maybe there's um, QT prolongation from electrolyte abnormalities. Maybe there's QT prolongation from long QT syndrome. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's QT prolongation from ischemia. Is there a situation where lidocaine is going to be most effective at presenting torsade? Yeah, it, it, I mean, uh, if you're doing a patch clamping experiment, you can demonstrate a slight shortening of the QT interval, sure. but clinically it's not meaningful. And if you have a, you know, we don't use it for long QT syndrome. It's, otherwise, that would be the drug. It makes sense. It would right. be the drug Absolutely. of choice, but it's not. It really doesn't work all that well. Um, the time I've seen it used is when you're sort of resuscitating somebody with torsade who is admitted for dofetilide, and you know people are kind of frankly panicking a little bit, and, and you feel like you need an antiarrhythmic drug when you've got a rhythm like that. But really, what you need is less antiarrhythmic drug. <laughs> it's like call off the <laughs> stop the insanity. Yes. And the drug to call for is one that you almost never call for in a code or a, or a rapid response is isoproteranol. Um, and if you do that, you could you could be the hero next time that comes up in the practice because it really works beautifully. It, it almost it's almost like shutting off the arrhythmia once you start isoproteranol. Excellent. And I've seen it a few times, and then everybody's you know around the bed and kind of looking at each other like I guess we're, our work is done. So if you do that, then you just keep the, continue the infusion going um, through a couple half lives, observe the patient in a monitored setting, and. That's really what needs to happen. Excellent. Thank you. Or if they've got a device, uh, call call in a device uh, tech or EP to, to reprogram and, and pace a little faster. Excellent. Excellent.